Chapter Twenty One of the Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Twenty One: The Selling of Spells. The period of stage four promised to be one of such a lucrative nature that the trio set to work to profit by it at once they bribed medical men to procure for them the mumia of people suffering from every kind of disease of criminal lunatics of idiots and epileptics they obtained by bribery also the blood and hair of the most abandoned men and women rakes thieves murderers they bottled and labelled arranged and catalogued the mumia in a laboratory designed for the purpose and when all their preparations were completed advertised spells for sale the modern sorcery company limited offer for sale every variety of spells love charms sleep charms etc in order to carry out the principal conditions of the compact namely to do harm they made pseudo love charms as follows they procured the hair of a girl whom they knew to be an incorrigible and at the same time heartless flirt and in the manner described and related in the last chapter made a magnus microscopy of it when ready for use that is after it had been in immediate contact with the girl's flesh so as to get it fully charged they had portions of it set in rings lockets and pendants and the purchaser of any one of these trinkets had only to persuade the object of his or her affection to wear it and his or her love would at once be reciprocated had the magnus microscopy been charged with real deep-rooted love the effect on the wearer would have been highly satisfactory but charged as it was with the effervescent and fleeting fancy of a flirt the effect on whoever wore it could not be more disastrous the sentiments of the hopeful purchaser would be reciprocated for a time which would probably lead to marriage after which the affection his adored had professed would suddenly decrease and before the honeymoon was over would have vanished altogether during the week following the announcement of the sale of these spells over a thousand were sold the applicants being mostly shop girls typists clerks and servants in the second week the sales rose to three thousand and every succeeding week showed a still greater increase in charging the magnus microscopy the motive of the purchaser had always to be taken into account if the love charm were wanted by a woman a housekeeper maybe who desired some rich old man to fall in love with her in order that she might come into his property or by a woman a companion probably who having wormed herself into the confidence of some eccentric old lady was anxious that lady should leave her all her money hamar took care that the magnus microscopy should be charged with a lasting infatuation and the sale of this love spell the spell that was sought solely that the purchaser might inherit property to which he or she had no claim far exceeded the sale of any other spell indeed it was extraordinary how many people people one would never have suspected desired spells that would do other people harm lady de green the well-known humanitarian who was most indefatigable in getting up petitions to the home secretary whenever the perpetrator of any particularly heinous and inexcusable murder was about to be hanged and who was universally acknowledged incapable of harming a fly called surreptitiously on hamar i understand she said everything you do here is in strict confidence certainly madam certainly hamar said we make it a point of honour to divulge nothing that being so lady de green observed i want you to tell me of a spell that will hasten some very obnoxious person's death if you will give me a rough idea of their personal appearance hamar said i will make a wax image of them and undertake they will trouble you no longer but lady de green shook her head she had no desire to commit herself can't you do it in any other way she said can't you let me give them an unlucky charm the sort of thing that might bring about a taxi disaster hamar thought for a moment and then smiled 
yes he said i think i can accommodate you leaving her for a few minutes he went to the laboratory and from a tin box marked homicidal lunatic he took a plain gold ring with this he returned to lady de green murmuring on the way the prayer he had learned from the table here you are he said handing the ring to lady de green give it to the person you have mentioned to me and the result you desire will speedily come to pass three days later london was immeasurably shocked it read in the papers that the highly accomplished lady de green beloved and respected by all for the strenuous exertions on behalf of humanitarianism had been barbarously murdered by her husband from whom unknown to the public she had been living apart for years who had suddenly and for no apparent reason become insane hamar who was immensely tickled alone knew the reason why this was no isolated case scores of society women came to the trio with the same request a spell or charm or something that will bring about a fatal accident not a lingering illness and the person for whom the accident was desired was usually the husband and the trio often indulged in grim jokes without a doubt lady minkhurst got her heart's desire when her husband abruptly cut his throat but alas amongst those decimated when the charm fell into the hands of one of the footmen was her ladyship's lover again mrs jacques the beauty who at one time wrote for half the fashion papers in england certainly secured the demise of colonel dick jacques who tumbled downstairs and broke his neck but as in his fall the colonel alighted on one of the maids who was not insured and so seriously injured her that she was pronounced a hopeless cripple mrs jacques with whom money was an object had of course to maintain her for the rest of her life likewise sir charles brimpton in jumping out of the top window of his house besides pulverizing himself pulverized too lady brimpton's pet pekingese waller without whom she declared life wasn't worth living and lord snipping in setting fire to himself set fire to lady snipping's boudoir which he had been secretly visiting and thereby destroyed treasures which she tearfully declared were quite priceless and could never be replaced crowds of young married women were anxious to get rid of their rich old relatives who clung on to life with a tenacity that was most wearying can you give me a spell that will make my grandfather go off suddenly a girl with beautiful sad eyes said plaintively to kelson don't think me very wicked but we are not at all well off and she has lived such a long time such a very long time you don't want her to be ill first i suppose kelson inquired oh no the girl replied she lives with us and we could never endure the worry and trouble of nursing her it must be something very sudden this will do it kelson said giving her a locket containing the mumia or essence of life of a mad dog fasten it round the old lady's neck and you will be astonished how soon it acts and what is your fee the girl asked her eyes blooming over with joyous anticipation for you nothing kelson said gallantly only tell no one may i kiss your hand the firm's sale of spells for getting rid of husbands having risen one day to five hundred and the sale of their spells for putting old people out of the way to fifteen hundred even hamar who was no believer in the perfection of human nature was astonished my word he remarked isn't this a revelation who would have thought how many people have murder in their hearts at least half society would i believe become homicides if only there were no chance of their being found out and punished anyhow if we go on at this rate there will be no old people left and it did indeed seem as if such would be the case for the moment the idea got abroad that old people could be thrust out of existence with absolute safety and ease there was a perfect mania amongst men women and even children to get rid of them and the deaths of people over sixty recorded in the papers multiplied every day the following is an extract from the planet of july twenty eight bolt on july twenty seven at number blank elgin avenue southwest emily jane loved and venerated mother of mary bolt m d in her sixty-ninth year 
drowned in her bath, and all the angels wept. Cushman, on July 27, at number blank, Sheep Street, Northampton, Sarah Elizabeth, adored mother of Josiah Cushman, Plymouth brother, in her 88th year, run over by a taxi. Joy in heaven! Starling, on July 27, at number blank, Snargate Street, Dover, Susan, highly esteemed and greatly beloved mother of Alfred Starling, Wesleyan minister, in her seventy-first year, lost in the harbor, asleep in Jesus. Tritickler, on July 27, at number blank, the terrace, St. Ives, Cornwall, Elizabeth, adored grandmother of Tobias Tritickler, Congregationalist, in her ninety-first year, fell over the Malatoff, O oh, paradise, O oh, paradise! Brute, on July 27, at Charlton House, Queensgate, Southwest, Jane, greatly beloved mother of John Brute, labor MP, in her 83rd year, fell down the area. Peace, blessed peace. Gum, on July 27, at number blank, Church Road, Upper Norwood, Sophia, widow of the late Albert Gum, L.C.C., in her eighty-fifth year, choked whilst eating tripe, sadly missed. Paveman, on July 27, at number blank, Queen's Road, Clifton, Bristol, and Rebecca, dearly beloved mother of Alfred Paveman, grocer, in her seventy-fourth year, accidentally burned to death, at rest at last but it must not be supposed from these few notices selected from at least a hundred that the applicants for spells were by any means confined to the upper and middle classes by far the greater number of spells were sold to the working people to those of them who prudent and respectable counted amongst their aged relatives at least one or two who were insured nor was the sale of spells confined to adults for among the numbers that flocked to consult the trio were countless county council children. "'Can you give me a spell to make teacher break her neck?' was the most common request, though it was frequently varied with demands such as, "'I'll trouble you for a spell to pay mother out. She won't put more than three lumps of sugar in my tea.' Or, "'Mother has got very teasy lately. I want a spell to make her fall downstairs.' Or, father only gives me twopence a week out of what i earn blacking boots give me a spell to make him have an accident whilst he's at work and it was not seldom that the trio were petitioned thus please give us a spell to make our parents die quickly teacher says at school perfect freedom is the birthright of all englishmen and we can't have perfect freedom whilst our parents are alive footnote twenty two lest the reader should query this let him consult the police in any of our big centres and he will learn that crime and prostitution is immensely on the increase among children in newcastle it is estimated that there are over two thousand girls of under fourteen years of age voluntarily leading immoral lives and making big incomes End of footnote the statistics of those who died from the effects of accidents for the week ending august one of this year in london alone were over sixty years of age five thousand between the ages of twenty five and sixty six thousand and for the latter deaths children alone were responsible the greatest number of these accidents occurred in poplar west ham battersea and whitechapel and at length the working-class applicants became so numerous that the modern sorcery company could not cope with them and were forced to raise their charges among other customers as one might expect were many militant suffragettes whom hamar and curtis palmed off on kelson give me a spell demanded a hatchet-faced lady wearing a half up to the knee skirt one that will cause the roof of the house of commons to fall in and smash everybody everybody this is no time for half measures had she been pretty it is just possible kelson might have assented but he had no sympathy for the ugly they set his teeth on edge he loathed them certainly madam certainly he said here is a spell that will have the effect you desire 
and he handed her a ring containing a magnus microscopy fully charged with the essence of life of an idiot wear it he said night and day never be without it she joyfully obeyed and within forty-eight hours was lodged in a home for incurables another woman if possible even uglier than the last approached him with a similar request let me have a spell at once she said that will make every member of the government be run over by taxis and killed they are monsters tyrants i abominate them let them be slowly very slowly squashed to death very well madam kelson said carefully concealing a smile here is what you want wear it next to your heart and he gave her a locket containing a magnus microscopy charged with the essence of life of a leper which he had procured at considerable risk and expense i consider your fee far too high the suffragette said you take advantage of me because i'm a woman very well madam he said i will make an exception in your case and let you have it for half the sum with a good deal more grumbling she paid half the fee and fastening the locket round her neck flounced out of the building as kelson gleefully anticipated the spell acted in less than two days and with such success that he was more than compensated for the monetary loss shortly afterwards kelson received a frantic visit from another suffragette a woman whose virulent sandy hair at once aroused his animosity quick quick she cried bursting into the room where he was sitting let me have a spell that will blow up every cabinet minister and their wives and families as well such an ambitious request as that madam felson rejoined cannot be granted in a hurry i must have time to no no at once the lady cried stamping her feet with ill-suppressed rage to consider how it can best be done kelson went on calmly i must have time to think the lady fumed but kelson remained inexorable and directly she had gone he made a wax image of her and taking up a knife chopped its head off in the evening he learned that a lady answering to her description had been run over by a train at chislehurst and decapitated kelson grew heartily sick of the suffragettes they were not only plain but abusive and he complained bitterly to hamar look here he said it's not fair you and curtis see all the decent-looking women and shelve all the rest on me i'll stand it no longer and he spoke so determinedly that hamar thought it politic to humour him very well matt he said forcing a laugh i'll try and arrange differently in the future after to-day you shall have your share of the pretty ones anything to keep the peace only remember no falling in love End of chapter 21 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California Chapter 22 of The Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins Chapter 22 The Persecution of the Martins Hamar's one great idea on reaching stage four was to utilize the torments as a means of getting Gladys. Though he saw crowds of pretty girls every day, none appealed to him as she did, and the very difficulty of getting her enhanced her value and stimulated his passions. "'I will give her one more chance,' he said to himself, "'and then if she won't have me, I'll plague her to death.' he went to the imperial and passing himself off as her father to the new official at the stage door entrance was shown into the ante-room which led to her dressing-room it took a good deal to scare hamar but he admitted afterwards that he did feel a trifle apprehensive whilst he waited her advent and his anticipations were fully realized why father she began as the door of her dressing-room swung open and she appeared on the threshold clad in a shimmering white dress that intensified her fair style of beauty what brings you the smile on her face suddenly died away you she cried how dare you go go at once and if you dare come here again or attempt to molest me in any way i'll prosecute you hamar dumbfounded at such an exhibition of wrath slunk out of the room without uttering a syllable 
the vixen he muttered as soon as he found himself in the street a thousand cats in one treated me like mud jerusalem i'll pay her out and i'll lose no time about it either she'll look differently at me next time we meet he hurried back to cockspur street and going into the laboratory threw himself into a chair and thought that same evening at nine thirty in the interval between her first and second going on gladys hastened to her dressing-room and was preparing to partake of the light refreshments she had ordered when to her horror she perceived crawling towards her across the floor a huge cockroach a hideous black thing with spidery legs and long antennae that it waved to and fro in the air as it advanced it was at least double the size of any gladys had hitherto seen and her feelings can best be appreciated by those who fear such things her blood ran cold her flesh crawled she sat glued to her chair terrified to move lest it should run after her she screamed and her dresser startled out of her senses came flying into the room what is it madam what is it she cried gladys pointed at the floor kill it she shrieked stamp on it oh quick quick it is coming towards me but the moment the dresser caught sight of the cockroach she sprang on a chair and wound her skirts round her oh madam she panted i daren't i daren't go near it i'm frightened out of my life at beetles and there's another of them and she pointed to the wainscoting and another why why the room's full of them and so it was everywhere gladys looked she saw beetles crawling towards her dozens upon dozens hundreds upon hundreds and all of the same monstrous size and ultra horrible experience look she screamed they are climbing on to my clothes one's got into my shoes and another will be in them in a second look there's another crawling up my cloak and another on my skirt oh oh and her cries and those of the dresser speedily brought a troop of actors and actresses to the door the instant however the cause of the alarm was ascertained there were loud yells and a wild stampede down the passages the stage manager was called but one glance at the floor was enough for him he fled and in the end three of the supers had to be fetched hot water brooms ashes and quicklime were used and although thousands of the cockroaches were killed thousands more came and so hopeless did the task of getting rid of them become that the room eventually had to be vacated and the cracks under the door securely sealed before gladys left the theatre she was called to the telephone who are you she asked hamar came the reply in insinuating tones how do you like the beetles you'll never see the end of them till but gladys rang off on her return home something scuttled across the hall floor in front of her she sprang back with a scream it was a gigantic cockroach the hall was full of them she summoned the servants and they set to work to kill them but they might as well have tried to stop niagara for as fast as they squashed one battalion another took its place they came out of cracks in the floor from behind the wainscoting from every conceivable place in the kitchens and in a dense black ribbon some six inches broad ascended the staircase gladys tried to barricade her room against them but it was of no avail they came from under the boards of the floor and poured down the chimney they swarmed over the furniture in the cupboards chest of drawers the washstand where they kept continually falling into the water in her clothes her dressing-gown was covered with them over the bed and the climax was reached when they approached the chair she stood on too fascinated with horror to move she watched them crawling up to her she was thus found by her father he had come to her assistance in the very nick of time and after lifting her from the chair and taking her to a place as yet safe from molestation returned to her room where with savage blows smashing equally beetles and furniture he remained till daybreak with the first streak of dawn the beetles decamped and the fray ended the work of devastation had been colossal corpses were strewn everywhere and it took the combined household hours before all evidences of the slaughter were obliterated as for gladys she had not slept all night and was a wreck i can never go through another night of it she said to miss templeton do you think we shall ever get rid of the horrible things we can but try dear miss templeton said consolingly 
and she accompanied gladys up to town where they inquired of doctors and chemists and all sorts of possible and impossible people and returned to kew laden with chemicals and patent beetle destroyers but though they tried remedies by the score none were of use and the beetles repeated their performance of the preceding night gladys did not go to bed surrounded with lighted candles she sat on the top of a wardrobe till daybreak the following morning the house was fumigated with sulphur and people were told off to kill the cockroaches as they made their escape out of doors by this means an enormous number were killed but at night they were just as bad as before an engineer friend then suggested a freezing machine the temperature of the house was reduced to ten degrees below zero the pipes froze and burst next day the milk froze the housemaid's toes and the cook's little finger of the left hand froze everything froze and presumably the beetles froze for there was not one to be seen however it was quite impossible to resort again to this extreme measure john martin had the most agonizing attacks of lumbago gladys had neuralgia and miss templeton a slight touch of pleurisy when gladys reached the imperial that evening she found that the staff had been battling with cockroaches all day and that they had at last succeeded in getting rid of them with a fumigation mixture of camphor cocculus sulphur bezonia and asafetida suggested to them by a hindu student for the next week not a beetle was to be seen at the theatre nor at the cottage and gladys was beginning to hope that hamar had ceased plaguing her in despair of ever winning her when the persecution suddenly broke out again she had been in bed about half an hour and was falling into a gentle and much-needed sleep when a tremendous rap at the wall close to her head awoke her with a start and set her heart pulsating violently thinking it must be someone on the landing she got up and lit a candle there was no one there the moment she got into bed again the rapping was repeated and it continued at intervals all night this went on for a week during which time gladys was never once able to sleep a brief respite ensued but it was abruptly terminated one morning when gladys awoke feeling as if some big insect were attempting to penetrate her body uttering a shriek of horror she whipped the clothes from her and sprang out of bed miss templeton who slept in the next room came rushing in and they saw an enormous insect half beetle and half scorpion dart under the pillow john martin was fetched but although he searched everywhere not a trace of the insect could be found that night directly gladys got in bed and blew out the light she heard a ticking sound on the sheets and a huge insect with long hairy legs ran up her sleeve her shrieks brought the whole household to the room but the insect was nowhere to be seen she was thus plagued for nearly a fortnight one insect only never a number but only one of prodigious size and terrifying form appeared to her in the least suspected places that is on the dressing-table or chimney-piece in her shoes or pockets crawled over her in the dark and could never be caught these perpetual frights and consequent sleeplessness wore gladys out she grew so ill that she had to give up acting and go into a home to try the rest cure hamar then communicated with her through a third person and offered to leave off tormenting her if she would agree to be engaged to him i never will she said then i will never leave off persecuting you was his retort but he was wary he had no wish to kill her or to damage her looks so he let her get well and remain thus for a brief space when she was once again in full vigour acting at the imperial he recommenced his unwelcome attentions at first he confined his new plague to the servants at the cottage the cook was one day turning out a drawer in the kitchen dresser when she was horrified out of her senses to find squatting there a large black toad which stared most malevolently at her and then sprang in her face she shrieked to the housemaid to help her kill it but before a weapon could be got the creature had bounced through an open window and disappeared after this incident the servants knew no peace their bedclothes were thrown off them at night their dresses torn and bespattered with ink their brushes and combs thrown out of the window and the water they poured out to wash in was sometimes quite black sometimes full of a bright green sediment and sometimes boiling when it invariably cracked both the jug and basin 
unable to stand these annoyances the servants left in a body their successors fared the same and worse besides having to endure the above-named horrors pebbles were thrown through the windows their chairs were pulled away as they were about to sit down the cook who was one of those upon whom this trick was played thereby seriously injuring her spine and all sorts of obstacles were placed on the stairs so that those who ran down unwarily tripped over them and hurt themselves two successive housemaids broke their legs whilst another sprained her wrist the meat too was a constant worry it went so bad that enormous maggots crawled out of it by the thousand and covered the table and floor and the milk of which a large quantity was taken daily turned in a very curious manner after being deposited in its usual place in the pantry it began to darken first of all it became light blue then deepened into an almost inky blackness exhibiting curious zigzag lines and lastly the whole mass began to putrefy and to emit a stench so overpowering that every one in the house wretched and the whole place had to be disinfected this occurred day after day nothing could stop it the dairyman who supplied the milk did all he could to counteract it he had his dairies constantly cleansed he saw that the cattle had a change of food he bought an entirely new stock of dairy utensils and no milk was ever sent to the cottage that he had not carefully analyzed the troubles continued for three weeks at the end of which period john martin received a telephone call from hamar hello the latter said i guess you've had about enough of it by this time wouldn't you like some sweet-smelling milk for a change or do you prefer to go on till you all get typhoid the remedy you know lies in your own hands you've only to tell that daughter of yours to accept me and i'll undertake all your troubles shall cease i'll see you hanged first john martin said very well then you old mule hamar shouted look out for yourself and miss gladys end of chapter twenty two read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter twenty three of the sorcery club by elliot o'donnell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter twenty three love to bring about plagues of insects hamar had resorted to a very simple method he had first of all made a wax image representing a cockroach scorpion centipede or whatever other species came into his mind then placing the image he had made in front of him and repeating the prayer he had learned from the unknown through the medium of mrs anderson waite's table he had concentrated body soul and spirit on plaguing gladys with the insect which the image represented when his concentration reached the highest degree insects in their actual physical bodies were transported from the tropics footnote twenty three there is no doubt that moses inflicted the plagues with which he tormented pharaoh in this way End of footnote. to produce the wrappings on the walls of gladys's room he had made a wax representation of a wall and whilst concentrating to the very utmost had struck it with his knuckles the plaguing of the servants hamar had also accomplished by means of images and concentration but in order to bewitch milk he had been obliged to resort to other means he had converted the mumia of an idiot into a magnus microscomy and bribing the man who delivered the milk he gave him instructions to soak the magnus microscomy for a few minutes in every portion that he left at the cottage footnote twenty four in stage two this might have been performed by ethereal projection but hamar could not resort to this method as the power of projection had now passed from him End of footnote. at length hamar having failed to gain his object by plaguing gladys and the servants set about tormenting john martin he made a wax image of the latter and after pronouncing the necessary prayer stuck the image full of pins crying out as he did so john martin i hate you john martin i curse you john martin a plague on you 
and at each time hamar stuck a pin in the image he had made of john martin the real john martin felt an acute pain in the region of his body corresponding to that in which the pin was stuck the doctor who was called in could make nothing of the malady but following the etiquette of the profession cloaked his ignorance with a look of profound wisdom and the pronouncement that he would tell them in a day or two what was the matter in the meanwhile he found it necessary and politic to prescribe a non-committal mixture of chalk and rhubarb which although disguised under the usual fanciful pharmacopoeia appellation did not however allay the pain sharp agonizing pricks now on the neck now in the chest now in the most sensitive part of the knee-cap now under the toe-nail now most painful of all under the fingernail continued to torment john martin who though as a rule fairly stoical could not stand these attacks with any degree of composure he screamed and swore and cursed until the whole household was terrified and gladys pretty nearly out of her mind during a lull an interval wherein john martin enjoyed a brief respite the telephone bell rang hello called the voice i'm hamar haven't you had about enough of it remember you've only to say the word and i'll stop tell him i'll do nothing of the sort john martin said that he'll never get the better of me this way miss templeton gave the message and hamar replied wait wait and see he then thrust wool pins horse nails straw needles and moss into the mouth of the image and john martin had such frightful pains in his stomach that he went into convulsions and after an emetic had been given him vomited up all the above-named articles save the pins and needles which worked their way out through his flesh causing him the most exquisite tortures gladys having given up on going to the theatre in order to be with her father during these attacks now declared that she could no longer bear to see him in such excruciating pain whilst it was in her power to prevent it tell him she said tell hamar you'll accept his conditions don't think of me i would rather do anything than see you suffer like this i can hold out a bit longer he groaned at any rate i needn't give in yet every now and then there came a respite perhaps for several hours perhaps for several days then the tortures recommenced and always john martin steeled himself to bear them at last came the climax hamar infuriated that his efforts so far had proved fruitless resolved since time was pressing to play his trump card and either win or lose all he rang up gladys on the telephone my patience is exhausted he said i'll give you one more chance and one only agree to be engaged to me at once or i'll smite your father with the most virulent form of cancer and leave him to die there was no question now in gladys's mind as to what she should do of all things in the world she dreaded cancer most and after the many evidences hamar had given her of his skill in black magic she did not doubt for one instant he could immediately he chose carry out his threat i have decided she said faintly to to give in you accept me then hamar said y yes when may i see you when you like then i'll come at once hamar replied au revoir but hamar when he arrived at the cottage did not realize any of the gleeful anticipations he had indulged in en route gladys was ill so miss templeton informed him at the same time begging him if he really had any regard for miss martin not to ask to see her for the next few days and to this request hamar seeing no alternative was obliged to consent shortly after he had gone shiel davenport called and found gladys alone in the garden i have been told your father is ill he said and should like to hear better news of him how is he i think he's all right now gladys replied but he has suffered frightfully indeed we've all had a terrible time and she told him what had happened then you've not been acting at the imperial lately she asked not for the past week gladys replied i couldn't leave father how has mr bromley burnham got on without you she asked bitterly i don't understand you gladys said quietly i have an understudy and from what i am told she has given every satisfaction i have some news which i fear won't be altogether welcome to you shiel turned a shade paler what is it he faltered 
i'm engaged to be married for a few moments there was silence and then shiel exclaimed mechanically engaged to be married to whom to leon hamar i couldn't help it and she explained the position but he'll never keep you to it shiel said you couldn't be such a brute i'm afraid he will gladys replied he's shown pretty clearly that he's capable of anything i've given him my promise i must keep it then it's good-bye to all interest in life for me shiel said with a gulp i've thought of no one but you since we first met for you in the hope of some day winning you i've struggled on i've reconciled myself to a bare existence now i've lost you i've lost everything i hate life i shall you'll do nothing of the sort gladys interrupted unless you want me to regret ever having met you i wonder that you say i've nothing to live for when we can still be friends and when you can at least win my respect by putting your shoulder to the wheel and exerting yourself to the utmost to get on and you what about you never mind me i can well look after myself you'll live in hell shiel cried her eyes goading him to madness even though you may not care for me i do not choose to stand quietly by whilst you spend your life in purgatory hamar has won you through some diabolical trickery and if i can't thwart him in any other way i'll kill him he shan't marry you he will gladys sighed no one can stop him he is omnipotent apparently gladys's statement was more or less true and ninety-nine men out of a hundred in the same circumstances as shiel would have now recognized the hopelessness of the situation but shiel was abnormal as he walked home from the cottage that evening he kept on repeating to himself gladys is my goal i want only gladys i'll have only gladys and having once made up his mind to get gladys it seemed to him as if out of every obstacle that lay between him and gladys he could and would merely make a stepping-stone since he argued to himself all's fair in love and war i'll win gladys through another woman and he straightway telephoned to lilian rosenberg to have tea with him the latter had already made an engagement for the afternoon but all the same she accepted shiel's invitation will you do me a favour he asked if it is anything that lies in my power she said what is it i want you to find out how hamar works his spells i asked you before i know you did and i'm not forgotten lilian said but i have to be very careful i've played the part of eavesdropper once or twice and heard enough to confirm me in my suspicions that hamar is in touch with evil occult powers i've heard him praying aloud to them on more than one occasion and i've also a shrewd idea he performs at least some of his spells by means of wax images but why do you want to know only curiosity i am intensely interested in the occult you don't want to start a rival show do you lillian asked jestingly with a maximum capital of two pounds and a minimum of knowledge shiel laughed hardly i wish i could i would offer you the post of manageress partner well partner if you like would you take it perhaps she said looking at him with a sudden shyness what a pity you are not rich can't you get a post that would bring you in about two hundred pounds a year for a start i believe you really want something to stimulate you to make you work in grim earnest and then you would succeed there's grit in you i love grit but at present it's latent it wants bringing out you are very kind shiel said but i'm afraid i'm a hopeless case and being such have no business to be in your company will you come to the theatre with me the theatre when you've no business to be in my company and when it is as much as you can do to pay the rent of a back attic oh never mind that i've had tickets given me i've been doing odd bits of journalism lately and a dramatic critic i know has given me two stalls at the imperial the imperial lillian rosenberg ejaculated that's where gladys martin is acting surely i can't bear her she's not the only person in the cast shiel observed dryly and the play's a good one do come with a little more persuasion shiel gained her consent and both he and she enjoyed the play or more correctly speaking the occasion immensely so long as gladys was on the stage shiel's eyes never once left her 
whilst throughout the performance lilian rosenberg saw only shiel thought only of shiel the interest she had taken in him the interest she had so confidently asserted was only interest had grown apace had grown out of all recognition it needed only a philip now to convert the interest into something warmer and the philip was not long in coming shiel was seeing lilian home to her lodgings in margaret terrace a turning off oakley street when a man knocked a woman down right in front of them he was just the ordinary type of street ruffian the whitewashed english labourer and the woman having without doubt been served by him in the same manner fifty times before was probably well used to such treatment but it was more than shiel who had spent so much of his life where they treat women differently could stand and before lilian rosenberg had time to remonstrate he had rushed up to the prostrate woman and was holding the man at bay a scuffle now began in which the woman whom shiel had helped regain her feet joined both man and woman now attacked shiel who placing himself with his back against the railings defended himself as best he could the hour was late there were no police about and it seemed only too probable that the fracas would end in a tragedy the labourer was a burly fellow shorter than shiel but far broader and heavier and any one could see at a glance that shiel stood no chance against him lilian rosenberg at her wit's end to know what to do ran into oakley street and there was no one in sight she made for the nearest lighted house and rang the bell furiously a man came to the door whom unheeding his expostulations she caught by the arm and dragged into the street they arrived on the scene of action just as the ruffian breaking through shiel's guard struck him a terrific blow on the forehead which sent him reeling against the railings the newcomer upon whom both man and woman seeing shiel incapacitated instantly turned would probably have shared the same fate had not the occupants of several of the neighbouring houses amongst whom were some half-dozen athletic young men roused by the noise came out into the street and the ruffian and his companion seeing the odds were against them decamped shiel had not fully regained consciousness when lilian rosenberg regardless of propriety led him into her sitting-room bathed his forehead dosed him with brandy and making up a bed for him on the sofa bade him rest there till the morning when he took his departure he had quite recovered and lilian rosenberg had at last realized that she loved him end of chapter twenty three read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter twenty four of the sorcery club by elliot o'donnell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter twenty four the subpoena a few days after the incident in margaret terrace shiel had an inspiration he was lunching with an old schoolfellow whom quite by chance he had met in lincoln's inn having previously lost sight of him for many years and the conversation which had at first been confined to the old days had gradually drifted to what was ever upmost in shield's mind namely the modern sorcery company that is hamar kelson and curtis did you know his friend remarked that the old statute introduced in henry the fifth's reign against sorcery has never been repealed you don't mean to say so shield cried excitedly a vague idea dawning on him tell me all about it well that's rather a long order for one thing it imposes all kinds of penalties from capital punishment to fines for another it was in force up to the beginning of george the third's reign when the last case of a person being burned for witchery in england occurred and since then it has fallen into disuse could it be revived shiel asked a sudden wild hope surging through him for all i know to the contrary it could his friend who by the way was a barrister replied of course no one could be burned or hanged under it but they might be fined or imprisoned then i wish to goodness you would file a case against the modern sorcery company i'd move heaven and earth to get the scoundrels sent to prison and he told his friend how matters stood between gladys and hamar 
the barrister whose name was sevening h v sevening of t c d and cheltenham college renown was keenly interested it was not only that his sense of chivalry was stirred but he saw sport consequently the foregoing conversation resulted in a prosecution which taking place some four weeks later was reported in the london herald as follows extraordinary charge heard at the old bailey revival of an ancient statute yesterday at the old bailey before his honour judge rosher leon hamar edward curtis and matthew kelson of the modern sorcery company limited were indicted under the twenty-third of henry the fifth c fifteen which makes it a capital offence to practice and administer spells the case for the prosecution promises to be a lengthy one an enormous number of witnesses who are most anxious to make statements will be called and it is anticipated that much of their evidence will be of a most extraordinary nature the accused are cited with having worked spells to the injury which injury in many instances has been fatal of a vast number of people representing every rank in life hilda countess of ramsgate who appeared in heavy mourning was the first witness called in her evidence she stated that it was owing to an advertisement she had seen in the ladies meadow that she had consulted the modern sorcery company limited with the object of buying a spell to prevent her pekingese pet brutus catching colds in his liver she had hoped to see mr kelson as she had heard that he was more sympathetic where ladies were concerned than either mr hamar or mr curtis but as mr kelson was engaged she had consulted mr edward curtis instead the latter had given her a spell which he had assured her would have the desired effect but directly she got home her adored brutus developed melancholia and died raving mad after having bitten her child who by the way had died too for the defence gerald kirby k c declared that the spell his client had given the countess was perfectly harmless that it could not possibly have produced either melancholia or madness can any dependence he said be placed on a woman who obviously thinks more of her dog's death than that of her child the court was adjourned till to-morrow in the following day's paper the evidence for the prosecution was continued lady marjorie tatler who in the weekly and illustrated journals for no other reason than her reputed beauty was introduced over and over again to the long-suffering public was the first to step into the witness-box she declared that edward curtis instead of giving her a spell to make florilda win the derby had given her a diabolical something that brought out spots all over her face and that she had to undergo a most expensive treatment before they could be got rid of in cross-examination lady marjorie tatler admitted that she had asked edward curtis for a spell that would cause all the horses running in that particular race save florilda to be taken ill for the defence gerald kirby k c explained that his client was so disgusted at the immorality of lady marjorie's request that he had purposely given her a spell that would have no effect upon a horse and could not possibly bring out spots on her ladyship's face the spell edward curtis gave her gerald kirby said was a mixture of hemp seed and sago flavoured with violet powder and my client instructed her ladyship to wear it next her heart loud laughter lady coralie mars the next witness who declared she had sought a spell to make the man she was forced into marrying fall into a trance just before the marriage ceremony was to take place and that instead of bringing this about the spell edward curtis had sold her had caused her to have st vitus's dance was adroitly trapped into admitting that she had really wanted her fiance smitten with paralysis a wish gerald kirby announced with a dramatic flourish of his hands that so aroused my client's indignation that instead of giving her the spell she wanted he gave her one that would make her affianced husband more than ever hungry for the marriage hour to arrive as for st vitus's dance would any woman with an emotional and hysterical nature such as obviously was that of lady coralie mars ever be free from such a complaint the hon augusta mapple who stated that she had visited the modern sorcery company for the purpose of obtaining a spell to bring about a defeat of the government 
by afflicting the bulk of their supporters with such bilious attacks as would necessitate their absence from the house and that instead of giving her such a spell edward curtis had given her one which had caused every member of her household to fall downstairs admitted under cross-examination that she had asked for a spell that would make every supporter of the government in the house be suddenly seized with tetanus a diabolical request your lordship gerald kirby said and one to which my client could not possibly accede consequently as punishment for such cruelty he sold her a spell that would result in her having a sharp attack of toothache it could not possibly have produced any of the mishaps she attributes to it it is unnecessary to quote further by far the greater number of these witnesses on being cross-examined by mr kirby who defended with an ability that has rarely if ever been excelled were made to confess that they had wanted the spells for a far more subtle and dangerous purpose than they had previously stated admissions which of course were highly prejudicial to the case for the prosecution shiel lost hope he had looked forward to the trial with an excitement that almost bordered on frenzy it was never out of his mind he thought of it at meals he thought of it at his work he thought of it out of doors and when he went to bed he dreamed of it i'll save you i'll save you yet he wrote to gladys the trial can only result in one thing the breaking up and imprisonment of the trio but when he read the papers each day and saw how in almost every instance evidence which ought to have been damning to the accused had been twisted into their favour his heart sank there was only one chance now lillian rosenberg she of all the staff employed in the hall in cockspur street was best acquainted with the modus operandi of messrs hamar curtis and kelson we must get a hold of that girl at all costs h v savening remarked to shiel you say you feel sure she likes you work upon her feelings to show the firm up i don't much like the idea of it shiel said but i suppose the end justifies the means of course it does savening retorted it's your only chance of saving miss martin acting on this suggestion shiel approached lillian rosenberg on the subject what about the spells he asked her have you found out yet how hamar works them i have only heard him muttering in his room again she said her cheeks paling and you you will only laugh at me i have seen queer shadows hovering in his doorway stealing down the passages shadows that terrified me i never knew what real fear was before i came to cockspur street and for the past few weeks i have been almost too afraid to open my room door for fear i would see something standing outside you have no doubt i suppose in your mind that the trio practise sorcery i certainly think they are helped in all they do by evil spirits do you approve of such proceedings i don't think them right i don't think we have any right to pry into the unknown some day undoubtedly it will be given us to know but until that day comes we had far better leave it alone if you think like that shiel said how can you reconcile yourself to working for this people how can i help myself lillian rosenberg answered beggars can't be choosers i am not responsible for what they do but supposing you knew they were about to commit a very heinous crime wouldn't you feel it your duty to try and circumvent them that depends lillian rosenberg said if i could stop them without running any risk of losing my post then i would probably try to stop them but if stopping them meant being sacked i most certainly shouldn't it isn't easy to get posts nowadays especially good paying posts like this what do you take me for a fool then you don't believe in self-sacrifice even for a friend shiel said slowly that depends on the degree of friendship lillian replied if it were for someone i liked very much then perhaps is there anyone you like very much i somehow can't fancy you being very fond of anyone couldn't you lillian said with a faint sigh you don't think me capable of any deep affection you forget perhaps that a woman doesn't always wear her heart on her sleeve i confess i don't understand women shiel said and i had best come to the point at once i happen to know that the trio or at least one of the trio is contemplating doing something ultra abominable a cruel and shameful wrong which i particularly wish to prevent but i may not be able to do anything without your help will you help me how can i 
lillian asked why by finding out something which might be damning evidence against them or by stating your opinion in court there is only one way of staying the trio from doing this dastardly thing and that is by getting this case which is now being tried to go against them well and, and supposing by some chance the defendants should win what would become of me ah that is where your self-sacrifice would come in it would be a noble action how does this wrong you say they are about to perpetrate touch on you personally it touches on someone with whom i am personally acquainted someone you like yes a relation that i can't say then i can't help you i am naturally inquisitive curiosity is as you know a woman's privilege you must tell me all it's for a friend then a man no shiel replied for a girl there was an emphatic silence and then lillian rosenberg spoke have i ever heard you mention her occasionally shiel replied there was silence again then lillian rosenberg said slowly you surely don't mean gladys martin i can think of no one else i do mean her shiel replied dropping his eyes she is to be coerced into marrying hamar the silly fool lillian rosenberg said i would like to see anyone trying to coerce me and it is to serve her you want me to sacrifice myself and she turned away in disgust after this interview lillian studiously avoided shiel and despairing at length of ever winning her over shiel reported his failure to h v sevening we must subpoena her said sevening you'll never get her to speak that way shiel said if once she has made up her mind not to do a thing nothing will ever compel her i have heard that said of people before h v sevening replied dryly but it's wonderful what the witness box can do it loosens the most mulish tongues in a marvellous manner it wouldn't hers shiel maintained h v sevening however thought he knew best what lawyer doesn't moreover it was all part of the game the great game of becoming notorious at all costs he served the subpoena like most modern girls lillian rosenberg was wholly selfish and for this fault only her parents were to blame she had been brought up with the one idea of pleasing herself of saying and doing exactly what she thought fit and no one had ever thwarted her now however the unforeseen had happened she was smitten with the grand passion and confronted for the first time in her life with the startling proposition of self-sacrifice she loved shiel she wouldn't marry him for the very simple reason he had no money but that only added poignancy to the situation she loved him all the more she knew shiel loved gladys martin whether he could ever marry gladys martin was another matter but he loved her all the same and the proposition that had been so abruptly thrust upon lillian rosenberg was that she should sacrifice herself not only to save gladys martin from marrying hamar but to pave the way for shiel supposing gladys could reconcile herself to penury or marry herself in other words she had been called upon to give up what was at the moment dearest to her in the world and to court all the inconveniences and worries of being thrown out of employment for if she gave evidence that would in any way tend to damage the firm of hamar curtis and kelson she would undoubtedly lose her post and in all probability never get another at least not another as good for the sake of a woman whom she did not know but nevertheless hated yet there was in her as there is in almost every girl however up to date a uh, chord responded to the heroic a short time back she would have scoffed at the very thought of self-sacrifice but now she actually caught herself considering it she kept on considering it too until the trial was well advanced and had practically made up her mind to denounce the trio and go to the wall herself when the subpoena was served end of chapter twenty four read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter twenty five of the sorcery club by elliot o'donnell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. 
Chapter Twenty Five Curtis in a New Role In an instant, Lillian Rosenberg had decided the course she would adopt. What a disgusting thing to do! she indignantly exclaimed. I wouldn't have believed it of Shiel. The idea of forcing me to give evidence, of forcing me to save the situation for the sake of the woman he thinks he loves, I shan't do it and she proved as good as her word apart from her importance as a witness considerable interest attached to her on account of her appearance and she was infinitely more attractive than any of the women who had hitherto appeared in the witness box though many of them were so-called society beauties you are wrong was the look which shiel read in h v sevening's eyes as lillian rosenberg took the oath she is on our side but simple as shiel was in many ways he knew women better than the lawyer and the exceedingly sweet expression lillian rosenberg had assumed which he knew to be quite foreign to her filled him with misgivings nor was he mistaken the evidence she gave was entirely in favour of the trio the case for the prosecution was concluded for the defence gerald kirby k c resorted to satire he characterized the whole proceedings as the most absurd heard in any court for the past two centuries, and wondered only that it had been possible to procure a counsel for such a ridiculous prosecution. "'Even though,' he remarked, "'spirits such as have been specified by the prosecution do exist, which is extremely dubious, there has never been yet produced any reliable corroborative evidence respecting them and the prosecution has wholly failed to prove that it is through the medium of these spirits that the modern sorcery company have worked their spells the marvellous feats that we have all seen performed in cockspur street have been accomplished as the defendants have all long stated through will sheer will power and nothing else and i intend producing evidence to show that the secret of the wonderful efficacy of all the charms and spells sold by the sorcery company lies in will-power too whenever they have been consulted with regard to the purchasing of a spell the firm have invariably pointed out this fact to the purchasers carefully explaining at the same time that the rings lockets and other articles sold to them were merely to assist them in concentration it is ridiculous to suppose that such trivial articles could have produced of themselves such calamities as the witnesses for the prosecution attributed to them but of course you did not believe the statements of such witnesses how could you how could you expect anything but falsehood from women who upon cross-examination had owned that their object in obtaining the spells was a far more dangerous object than they had at first led you to suppose they sought spells that would do evil and that evil was not accomplished now i ask you if the firm worked their spells through the instrumentality of evil spirits for it is assuredly only evil spirits that are associated with sorcery would not the spells they sold naturally have brought about the sinister results for which they were required undoubtedly they would and they failed to produce the desired effect simply because their efficacy depended not on spirit agency but on human will power which power one could only too plainly see the society ladies who had witnessed for the prosecution did not possess it may be asked why the defendants if they do not accomplish their spells through black magic style themselves the sorcery company and so mislead the public obviously they do so purely for advertisement the sorcery company is an attractive title a catchy title and for this reason which is surely a legitimate one since it is strictly in accordance with the prevailing custom of advertisement the firm of hamar curtis and kelson adopted it they did not expect they were not so extraordinarily foolish as to expect any one would take them literally they thought as you and i think that sorcery cannot be taken seriously that it is confined to fairy tales and that as a fairy tale it is potent only in the nursery this was the gist of the counsel's speech for the defence 
a number of witnesses then gave evidence for the defendants and when the prosecuting counsel rose it was only too evident that he was pleading for a lost cause the court with ill-concealed derision barely accorded him a hearing two hours later the meteor always the first in the field when sensations crop up headed the first column of their front page with collapse of the sorcery case crushing speech by gerald kirby k c acquittal of the defendants the judge so the meteor reported expressed himself in absolute agreement with the defending counsel the action he said ought never to have been brought it was sublimely ridiculous to accuse any one of being in league with forces in the existence of which no sane person could possibly believe shiel was in despair all chance of saving gladys seemed to be fast disappearing he telephoned to her and was answered by miss templeton gladys she said i'd gone out with hamar who had motored down to the cottage the moment the trial was over and the verdict known i wish to god we had won the case shiel observed so do i miss templeton replied and so did gladys she regards her position now as absolutely hopeless tell her not to lose heart shiel answered hurriedly if i can't find another means i'll but miss templeton rang off and he spoke to the wind full of wrath against lilian rosenberg he went round to see her and met her just as she was entering her house i've come to see you for the last time he announced after the way you behaved in court we can no longer be friends i don't understand she said in a rather faltering voice what have i done only perjured yourself shiel retorted the tale you told the judge was very different to the tale you told me therefore it is impossible for us to continue our friendship i could never have anything to do with a woman whose word i can't rely upon whose character i scorn whom i despise and he was going to add detest but checked himself and unable to trust himself in her presence any longer he gave her a glance of the utmost contempt and wheeling around walked quickly away as in a dream lilian rosenberg went upstairs to her pillow and throwing herself on the bed buried her face in the pillow and indulged in a fit of crying it was not the thought of losing shiel that was so painful to her she might have grown reconciled to that it was the thought of losing his esteem most people would agree with her would assure her she had done the right thing in looking after number one what after all is perjury she argued nearly every one in this world perjure themselves at one time or another certainly all women but it was not the opinion of the majority she cared about it was the respect of the one the respect she had wilfully and spitefully sacrificed was it too late to recover it with regard to gladys she was very sceptical the reluctance to accept hamar as her future husband she still believed to be all pretense and she felt convinced that gladys in her heart of hearts was only too glad to get the chance of marrying any one so rich this being so she could not bring herself to think she had done shiel any actual wrong gladys would never marry him the only person she had harmed was herself she had lied and shiel was not the sort of man to condone an offence of that sort easily still weeping would do no good it would only make her ugly she got up had tea and went out she could think better in the open air it soothed her for some reason or other customs perhaps she strolled towards cockspur street and there ran into one of the few people she particularly wished to avoid kelson he was delighted to see her it's nectar to me to be out again he said jerusalem it was awful in the courts have supper with me it was a fine starlight night the air cool and refreshing and a wild abandonment seized lilian rosenberg she would have supped with the devil had he asked her i've nothing to lose now she said to herself nothing i'll have my fling where shall we go she asked it must be somewhere entertaining why not to my rooms he said we can talk better there we shall be all alone she raised no objection and they were about to step into a taxi when hamar and curtis suddenly put in appearance matt hamar cried seizing his elbow i want a word with you not now kelson protested looking hungrily at lillian yes now hamar said at once i shan't keep you more than five minutes and he dragged kelson away with him 
the moment they had gone curtis who was obviously the worse for drink addressed lillian kelson won't come back he said hamar is mad with him he says if he ever sees you two together again he'll sack you let me take his place a sudden inspiration came to her there were one or two things she badly wanted to know and with a bit of coaxing curtis in his present state might tell her anything she would try all right she said i'll come they got into the taxi and curtis as far as his fuddled senses would allow made violent love to her after supper they had supper in his rooms he grew a deal more amorous she let him sit close beside her she let him put his arm round her waist but before she let him kiss her she struck her bargain no she said thrusting him away not just yet that can come later if you are good i want you to tell me something first about this marriage of mr hamar and miss martin is it likely to come off is it likely curtis said with a stupid leer is it likely not much leon means nothing he only wants the fun of being engaged to a pretty girl like i watched fun with you nothing more then he'll throw her over after a while after he gets what he wants to get and suppose she proved different to what he expects after he passes stage seven that will be all right curtis said giving her waist an emphatic squeeze everybody will be all right then you and matt for example and i in whisky stage seven what do you mean why don't you know curtis gurgled and then a sudden gleam of intelligence came into his watery eyes he added no, i shan't tell you nothing shall make me it's a secret i won't kiss you till you do lillian rosenberg said i'll make you oh no you won't lillian rosenberg cried disengaging herself from his grasp and rising don't you dare touch me i'm going curtis watched her with a helpless grin then he suddenly cried out come back come back i say well will you do as i want lillian rosenberg said i'll do anything anything to please you if only you stay with me she sat down and his arm once again encircled her now she said pushing his face away tell me bit by bit she drew out of him the whole history of the compact with the unknown how in stage five the stage they were about to enter they would have fresh powers conferred upon them their present power that is of working spells and causing diseases being then cancelled how they would obtain supreme power over women when they reached the final stage stage seven and how the compact would be broken and their ruin brought about should either of them marry or should anything happen before this final stage was reached to disunite them lillian could account for a great deal now the uncanny feeling she had always experienced in the building the curious enigmatical shadows she had seen hovering about the doorways and flitting down the passages the extraordinary nature of the feats and spells hamar's mutterings and his fury whenever kelson spoke to her were no longer wholly unintelligible but she must know all she must be most exacting finally she got from curtis everything there was to be got from him and she laughed immoderately when he excused himself on the grounds that it was all leon's doings leon had told him to offer her a little compensation for the loss of her escort and you have compensated me more than enough lillian rosenberg said now you shall have your reward and she kissed him kissed him three times for luck but you're not going he said staggering to his feet and attempting to hold her you're not going till the roshi morning sun shines shoshily in on us oh yes i am she said i've had quite enough of you good-bye and before he could prevent her she had run to the front door and let herself out end of chapter twenty five read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california Chapter Twenty Six of the Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Twenty Six In Hyde Park at Night. But now that Lillian Rosenberg was possessed of all this information respecting the trio, she was once again in doubt how to act, or whether to act at all. Supposing she were to attempt to warn Gladys Martin against Hamar, how would Gladys take the warning? Would she pay any attention to it? The odds were she would not. That having set her heart on marrying Hamar for his money, she would blind herself to his faults and resolutely shut her ears to anything said against him also there was the very great possibility of gladys being rude to her and even the thought of this was more than she could bear to contemplate if only shiel were reasonable if only he could be made to see how utterly ridiculous it was for him to think of winning such a girl as gladys gladys the pretty dolly-faced pampered actress who had never known a single hardship, had always had a well-lined purse, and would never, never marry poverty. Then back to Lillian Rosenberg's mind came her parting with Sheil. She recalled his intense scorn and indignation. A liar! He did not wish to have anything to do with a liar. It's a good thing every man is not so fastidious, she said to herself bitterly or the population of the world would soon fizz out she laughed he had never questioned her morals in any other sense perhaps in his innocence or assumed innocence he had thought them spotless at all events he had most graciously ignored them but a liar a liar he could not put up with and why because the lie had touched him on a sore point when lies do not touch a sore point they too are ignored she walked to the imperial and looked again at gladys's photographs how any man could fall madly in love with such a face was more than she could conceive it was a mincing maudlin finicking face it irritated her intensely she turned away from it in disgust yet came back to have another look and yet another god knows why it fascinated her Finally she left it, fully resolved to let its odious original go to her fate without a warning. Soon after her return to the hall in Cockspur Street, she was sent for by Hamar. "'Didn't I tell you,' he said, "'that you were on no account to encourage Mr. Kelson?' "'You did,' Lillian Rosenberg replied. "'Will you kindly explain, then,' Hamar said, "'why you have disobeyed my orders?' how have i disobeyed them lillian rosenberg asked how hamar retorted his cheeks white with passion you dare to inquire how why you were on the point of accompanying him to his rooms last night to supper when i stopped you i have overlooked your disobedience so many times that i can do so no longer your services will not be required by the firm after today fortnight won't they lillian rosenberg replied her anger rising i think you are mistaken i know a great deal too much to make it safe for you to part with me i know for instance all about your compact with the unknown you know nothing hamar said his voice faltering oh yes i do lillian rosenberg answered i know everything i know how you first got in communication with the unknown in san francisco i know how you receive fresh powers from the unknown every three months the old powers being cancelled i know the penalty you will undergo should the compact be broken and what is more i know how the compact can be broken how the deuce have you learned all this hamar stammered never mind am i to remain in your service or leave i think hamar said stroking his chin thoughtfully it is better that you should remain better for all parties i owe you some little recompense for your loyalty to the firm and for the admirable way you spoke up for the firm in court i will make you out a cheque for a hundred pounds now and your salary shall be doubled at the end of the week promise to keep out of mr kelson's way in the future for the next six months at any rate after that time you may see him as often as you like and i will give you as a wedding present a cheque for twenty thousand pounds twenty thousand pounds you are joking i'm not i vow and declare i mean it is that a bargain 
i will certainly think it well over lilian rosenberg said and let you know my decision later on from what curtis had told her she knew it was the last day of stage four that the trio that evening would be initiated into stage five the stage of cures and a mad desire seized her to witness the initiation but how would the unknown manifest itself on this occasion and to which of the trio she could not keep a close watch on the three of them if only she had been friends with shiel they might in some way have worked it together curtis had carefully avoided her since the supper but she had seen kelson and he had looked at her each time he met her as if he yearned to fall down at her feet and worship her should she attach herself to him for the evening and run the risk of another quarrel with hamar she dearly loved risks and dangers and the danger she would encounter in defying hamar appealed to her sporting nature it was easy to secure kelson one glance from her eyes and he would have followed her to timbuktu charing cross under clock after show to-night she whispered as she flew hurriedly past him i want to speak to you now it so happened that hamar had given kelson orders to return to his rooms directly the performance was over and to remain in them till morning in case he was wanted in connection with the initiation but he might have spared himself the trouble it was lillian and lillian only that kelson now thought of it was lillian and lillian only that he would obey the idea of meeting her of having her all to himself of being able to do her a service filled him with such uncontrollable delight that he hardly knew how to comport himself so as not to arouse hamar's suspicions directly the performance was over he sneaked out of the hall and pretending not to hear hamar who called after him he jumped into a taxi and was whirled away to the trysting place lillian rosenberg who arrived a moment later was dressed in a new costume and kelson thought her looking smarter and daintier than ever you shall kiss me at once she said if you promise me one thing and what is that he asked looking hungrily at her lips i want you to let me see the unknown when it comes to you to-night she said good god what do you know about the unknown he exclaimed his jaws falling and a look of terror creeping into his eyes a great deal she laughed so much that i want to learn more and of what she knew she told him just as much as she had told hamar and now she said i repeat my promise you shall have a kiss think of that if only you will hide me somewhere so that i can see the unknown or its emissary i would do anything for a kiss kelson said but i fear it is impossible to fulfil the condition because i haven't the remotest idea where or when the unknown will appear besides it is just as likely to go to hamar or curtis as to come to me and up to the present i haven't felt the remotest suggestion of its favouring me is this the only condition i can fulfil so that you will let me kiss you certainly lillian rosenberg replied i am not in the habit of being kissed such an event can only happen in the most exceptional and privileged circumstances such for example as exist at the present moment when i ask you to put yourself to some considerable trouble if not actually to incur danger in order to accomplish what i wish and yet i remember kissing you unconditionally kelson commented memory is a fickle thing lillian rosenberg replied and so is woman times have changed i'll leave you at once unless you promise to do your very utmost to grant my request kelson promised and after they had had supper at the trocadero suggested that they should take a stroll in hyde park i hope you are not awfully shocked he inquired rather anxiously but a sudden impulse has come over me to go there i believe it is the will of the unknown will you come with me we shan't be able to get in shall we it's so late lillian rosenberg said otherwise i should like to i'm rather in a mood for adventure they don't shut the gates till twelve kelson said and it's not that yet very well let's go then i'm game to go anywhere to see the unknown and so saying lillian rose from the table and kelson followed her into the street they took a taxi and alighting at hyde park corner entered the park it was very dark and deserted it's nearly closing time a policeman called out to them rather curtly we are only taking a constitutional kelson explained we shall be back in five minutes 
they crossed the road to the statue and were deliberating which direction to take when they heard a groan it's only some poor devil of a tramp kelson said the benches are full of them they stay here all night we had better perhaps turn back nonsense lilian rosenberg replied i'm not a bit afraid there's another groan i'm going to see what's up and before he could stop her she had disappeared in the darkness here i am she called come it's some one ill plunging on in the darkness kelson at last found lilian she was sitting on a chair under a tree by the side of a man who was lying curled up on the ground he's had nothing to eat for two days and has bright's disease lilian rosenberg announced can't we do something for him two gentlemen told me just now the man on the ground groaned that if i stayed here for a couple of hours they would pass by again and guarantee to cure me i reckoned there was no cure for bright's disease when it is chronic like it is in my case but they laughed and said we can or at least shall be able to cure anything what were the two gentlemen like kelson asked how could i tell the man moaned i couldn't see their faces any more than i can see yours but they talked like you twang 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 all through their noses sounds as if it might be hamar and curtis kelson remarked that's it the man ejaculated hamar i heard the other fellow call him by that name how long ago is it since they were here i can't say perhaps ten minutes i've lost count of time and everything else since i've slept out here they talked of going up to the serpentine we had better try and find them kelson said if you had the money couldn't you get shelter for the night lilian rosenberg said it must be awful to lie out here in the cold feeling ill and hungry i dare say some place would take me in the man muttered only i couldn't walk at least no distance Well here's five shillings lillian rosenberg said put it somewhere safe and try to hobble to the gates if they haven't closed them you will be all right five shillings the man gasped that's it's no good i can't count i've no head now thank you missy god bless you i'll get something hot something to stifle the pain he struggled on to his knees and lillian rosenberg helped him to rise how could you be so foolish as to touch him kelson said as they started off down a path they hoped would take them to the serpentine you may depend upon it he was swarming with vermin tramps always are very probably but i run just as much risk in a bus the twopenny tube or a cinematograph show besides i can't see a human being helpless without offering help listen there's someone else groaning the park is full of groans what she said was true the park was full of groans from every direction borne to them by the gently rustling wind came the groans of countless suffering outcasts legions of homeless starving men and women some lay right out in the open on their backs others under cover of the trees others again on the seats they lay everywhere those shattered tattered battered wrecks of humanity those gangrened exiles from society to whom no one ever spoke whom no one ever looked at whom no one ever would own that they had seen whose lot in life not even a stray cat envied here were two of them a man and a woman tightly hugged in each other's embrace not for love but for warmth lillian rosenberg almost fell over them but they took no notice of her every now and then one of them would emerge from the shelter of the trees and cross the grass in the direction of the distant gleaming water with silent stealthy tread once a tall gaunt figure suddenly sprang up and confronted the two adventurers but the moment kelson raised his stick it jabbered something wholly unintelligible and sped away into the darkness a scene like this makes one doubt the existence of a good god lillian rosenberg said it makes one doubt the existence of anything but hell kelson said compared with all this suffering the suffering of these thousands of hungry hopeless wretches the bulk of whom are doubtless tortured incessantly with the pains of cancer and tuberculosis to say nothing of neuralgia and rheumatism dante's inferno and virgil's hades pale into insignificance the devil is kind compared with god i believe you are right lillian rosenberg said i never thought the devil was half as bad as he was painted 
the park to-night gives the lie direct to the ethics of all religions and to the boasted efforts of all governments churches chapels hospitals police progress and civilization there is no misery i am sure to vie with it in any pagan land either now or at any other period in the world's history true kelson replied and why is it it is because civilization has killed charity giving in its true sense if it exists at all is rarely to be met with giving in exchange that is in order to gain flourishes everywhere people will subscribe for the erection of monuments to kings and statesmen or to well-known and often richly endowed charitable institutes in exchange for the pleasure of seeing in the newspapers a list of the subscribers names and themselves included amongst those whom they consider a peg above them socially or in exchange for votes or notoriety they will give liberally to the brutal strikers or outings for poor i suppose by the poor you mean the pampered ill-mannered and detestably conceited county council children lilian rosenberg chimed in i wouldn't give a farthing to such a miscalled charity no not if i were rolling in riches and i think you would be right kelson replied but for these really poor park refugees it is a different matter obviously no one will make the slightest effort to work up the public interest on their behalf simply because they are labelled useless they belong nowhere they have no votes they are too feeble to combine they are even too feeble to commit an atrocious murder consequently for the help they would receive they could give nothing in return by the by i doubt if they could muster between them a pair of suspenders a bootlace a shirt button or even a lilian rosenberg caught him by the arm stop she said that's enough don't get too graphic what's the matter with that tree they were now close beside the banks of the serpentine the moon had broken through its covering of black clouds and they perceived some twenty yards ahead of them a tall isolated line that was rocking in a most peculiar manner end of chapter twenty six read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california Chapter Twenty Seven of The Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Twenty Seven The Right Girl to Marry. Though the wind was nothing more than the usual night breeze of early autumn, the lime tree was swaying violently to and fro, as if under the influence of a stupendous hurricane lillian rosenberg and kelson were so fascinated that they stood and watched it in silence at last it left off swaying and became absolutely motionless they then noticed for the first time that there were three figures standing under its branches and that one of the figures was a policeman hide quickly kelson whispered those other two are hamar and curtis quick for god's sake or they will see you lillian rosenberg hid behind an elm hello kelson called out advancing to the group why it's you matt curtis cried hamar said you would come said i would come how the deuce did he know kelson exclaimed i didn't know myself to the moment before i started i will do you hamar explained as soon as i got back to my rooms after the show a voice said in my ears i heard it distinctly be at the serpentine the south bank underneath a lime tree you will know which at twelve to-night i looked round there was no one there naturally concluding this was a message from the unknown i hastened off to curtis who was in his digs and needless to say eating and having dragged him away with me in a diabolical temper i then sought you where were you taking a walk i felt i needed it alone you are sure you weren't out with some girl i swear it it seems as if i'm not the only liar lillian rosenberg said to herself in her place of concealment what would shield say to that huh. i don't know if i ought to believe you hamar remarked did you feel me willing you to come here rather kelson said that is why i came i seemed to hear your voice say to hyde park to hyde park the serpentine the serpentine then sinking his voice he whispered what's up with the policeman he looks deuced queer 
he's in a trance we found him like this hamar said he is undoubtedly under the control of the unknown i expect it to speak through him every moment get ready to take down all he says i've come prepared and he handed kelson and curtis each a pencil and a reporter's notebook he had hardly done so when the policeman a burly man well over six feet in height who was standing bolt upright as if at attention his limbs absolutely rigid his eyes wide open and expressionless began to speak in a soft lisping voice that the trio at once identified with the voice of the unknown the voice of the tree on that eventful night in san francisco the great secret of medicine the secret of healing will now be revealed to you the voice said pay heed in cases of tumors and ulcers take a young syringa lay it for half an hour over the stomach of the afflicted person then plant it with the mumia that is either the hair blood or spittle of the sick person at midnight as soon as the syringa begins to rot the ulcer will heal in phthisis pulmonalis the mumia of the sick person should be planted with a cutting of the catalpa after the latter has been subjected for some minutes to the breath of the diseased person as soon as the cutting shows signs of decay the sick person will be cured in diabetes plant the mumia of the patient with a bignonia and as soon as the latter begins to rot the diabetes will go in appendicitis cover the stomach of the sick person with a piece of raw beef until the sweat enters it then give the meat to a cat and as soon as the latter has eaten it the patient will recover what becomes of the cat kelson asked the appendicitis is transferred to it the voice explained it should be killed at once in cancer take the sea rack torek mendrek a weed of deep mauve colour streaked with white it must be boiled for three hours in clear spring water three ounces of rack to half a pint of water and then let to cool when quite cool the dessert spoon of it should be taken by the sufferer every four hours and at the end of two days the disease will have completely disappeared the rack is to be found at the twenty fathom level six miles west southwest of the skilly isles in bright's disease the mumia of the afflicted should be planted at one a m with a cutting of sassafras after the latter has been slept on for one whole night by the sufferer as soon as the sassafras begins to rot the patient will be cured in dropsy place a hair that has been strangled over the diseased portion of the body and let it remain there for one hour then bury the hair together with the mumia of the sick person and as soon as the hair begins to decay the patient will recover in jaundice and liver diseases apart from sarcoma plant the mumia of the afflicted at two a m with a cutting of black walnut and as soon as the latter begins to decay the sufferer will get well in all skin diseases the mumia of the patient must be planted at midnight with a cutting of hickory and when the latter begins to rot the disease disappears 
in all fevers the mumia must be planted at three a m with laurel cuttings after the latter have been placed under the bed of the patient for one night as soon as the cutting shows signs of rotting the fever abates in acute inflammations diseases of the heart rheumatism and lumbago the mumia must be buried at midnight with a raven that has been drowned and placed on a chair left by the side of the patient for one night as soon as the raven begins to rot the patient will be fully restored to health in cases of insanity hysteria and nervous diseases the mumia of the sufferer must be planted at two a m with a cutting of white poplar and as soon as the latter shows evidences of decay the afflicted will get well in cases of hypochondria and melancholia the mumia of the sufferer must be planted at four a m with a crocus and as soon as the latter begins to rot the disease will depart in every case it will be necessary to prelude the performance with the following invocation o oh, most powerful and prescient unknown before whom the greatest of the atlanteans prostrate themselves that was in the beginning that is now and always will be i conjure thee by the magic symbols of the club foot the hand with the fingers clenched and the bat in this magical year of kefana to extend to me thy wonderful powers of healing rena vadula hipsano aik deu barinas the lisping voice ceased and with a convulsive start the policeman came to himself hallo he said in his natural gruff tones rubbing his eyes i must have dropped off who are you what are you doing in the park at this time of night we've been watching you hamar said it is a bit of a phenomenon to see a london bobby asleep on his beat and to hear him talking in his sleep too curtis added i didn't know i was talking the policeman muttered it all comes of being too many hours on duty what have you got those notebooks out for not been taking down anything about me have you show us out of the park and you'll hear no more about it hamar said and we'll give you half a sovereign into the bargain kelson chimed in follow me then the policeman said i'll take you to one of the side entrances matt hamar exclaimed as they passed the tree beyond which lilian rosenberg was hiding i smell scent and what is more i recognize it it is violette de mer the scent that rosenberg uses you were with her this evening i swear i wasn't kelson replied i bought some scent in regent street this afternoon hm hamar grunted i have my doubts they walked on in silence till they came to a small iron gate where the policeman left them whilst he went to the lodge for the keys and all the while kelson was in terror lest hamar should catch sight of lilian rosenberg who had kept close behind them and was now standing but a few yards away trying to conceal her identity and escape notice but the policeman on his return with the keys called out to her and kelson fearing that she might either be taken in charge for loitering there in apparent suspicious circumstances or made to remain in the park all night neither of which contingencies he could possibly permit at once came forward and explained that she was a friend of his the policeman was satisfied the sight of another half-sovereign had rendered him more than polite and without saying a word he let them all out together the moment they were in the street hamar turned on kelson white with passion so he said i was right after all liar fool you would risk all our lives for a few hours flirtation with this silly girl if it's only flirtation leon what does it matter curtis interposed for goodness sake shut up wrangling and let's get home i'm starving i shall have something to say to you to-morrow morning hamar remarked in an undertone to lilian rosenberg and i to you was the furious reply 
i shall not forget the disrespectful way in which you have just spoken of me in alluding to the scent she signalled to a taxi and giving kelson a friendly good night jumped into it and was speedily whirled away on the whole the evening had been a disappointment she had wanted to see the unknown the awful thing that inspired kelson and his colleagues with such unmitigated horror and instead she had seen only an obsessed policeman a cataleptic copper who had he not spoken in a strangely uncanny voice would certainly have seemed to her absolutely ordinary with regard to hamar's displeasure she was not in the slightest degree disturbed he would never dare say anything to her and after all that had occurred he would never venture to sack her all the same she hated him there was just sufficient in her conduct to make the name he had called her by applicable therefore her bitterest wrath and indignation were roused against him he had behaved unpardonably she could kill him for it i'll just show him she said to herself what that uncivil tongue of his can do he shall see that it can do him infinitely more harm than all kelson's love-making for one thing i'll spoil his chances with gladys martin and i wonder if i could make use of what i know about him as a means of getting friendly again with shiel at all events i'll try with this object in view she went round to shiel's lodgings and was informed by the landlady that shiel was ill nothing serious i hope she asked it has been the landlady replied but he is better now it all came through his not taking proper care of himself may i see him do you think lilian rosenberg inquired i don't know the landlady grumbled he is in a very touchy mood no one can do nothing right for him but maybe there won't be any harm in you trying she added her eyes wandering to the half-crown in lilian rosenberg's fingers she opened the door somewhat wider and lilian rosenberg entered shiel was immensely surprised to see her illness and solitude had very considerably subdued him and though at first he showed some resentment he speedily softened under her sympathetic solicitation for his health she put his room straight and dusted the furniture got tea for him and when she had completely won him over by these kindly actions and made him beg her pardon for ever having spoken harshly to her she broached the subject all the while uppermost in her mind the subject of hamar and gladys he hasn't the slightest intention of marrying her she said all he wants is to make her his mistress so as to be able to throw her over the moment he gets tired of her and then marry someone of title he is tremendously taken with her of course her physical beauty which he had the impudence to tell me surpassed that of any other woman he had seen appeals strongly to his grossly sensual nature if she won't give in to him now she will be obliged to do so in six months time i don't understand you shiel said feebly why in six months time lilian rosenberg then told him what she knew about the compact so you see she added that if the final stage is reached no woman will be safe the trio will have any girl they fancy entirely at their mercy how inconceivably awful shiel exclaimed surely there is some way of stopping them there is only one way lillian said slowly the union between the three must be broken they must quarrel and dissolve partnership you may be sure they will take good care not to do that don't be too sure lillian rosenberg replied matthew kelson is very fond of me with a little persuasion he would do anything i asked then do you think you could bring about a rupture between him and hamar shiel asked eagerly i might and you will you will save gladys martin after all lillian did not reply at once do you think she is the sort of girl who would marry poverty she said evasively poverty like this and she glanced round the room i won't ask her to shiel exclaimed whilst i have been lying in bed ill i have thought of many things and have come to the conclusion i have no right ever to think of marrying it is difficult for me to earn enough to keep one person in comfort and i've lost all hope of ever earning enough to keep two well if you don't ask her lilian rosenberg said there's one thing she will never ask you and i think you are remarkably well out of it if you do ever marry marry a girl that has grit a girl that can be a real pal to you a girl that would help you to win fame End of chapter 27 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California